Hi there, and a very warm welcome to Season 5, Episode 22 of People Soup. It's Ross McIntosh here. I think about a specific example, you know, like, typically you're at work and you're like, right, I'm feeling tired, what can I do right now? Oh, well, I need to just caffeinate my way through this and push, push, push. Whereas if you take that second, like you say, between stimulus and response and you say, well, actually, what do I need right now? Maybe it's you haven't actually gotten up from your desk in the last two or three hours, you know, or if you're finding yourself going on BBC News and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, maybe it's that you need a break, you know? Um, mm. And the thing is, we get confused. We think, oh, well, I just need more caffeine rather than, well, actually, I haven't had enough sleep and I'm actually just tired or I need more sugar because, oh, well, actually, I just need that energy. But actually, are there other ways in which you can get that energy that feel more nourishing? Hey, supers. In our previous episode, I introduced you to Dr. Heather McKee. Heather is a health behavior change specialist. In this episode, we hear more about Heather's work, including how she creates the permission for carers to extend compassion towards themselves. We also chat about creating lifelong habits, looking after ourselves at work, and unraveling our unhealthy habits. It's packed with takeaways, and Heather also reveals the secret sauce we can all use to support ourselves. People Soup is an award-winning podcast where we share evidence-based behavioral science in a way that's practical, accessible, and fun to help you glow to work a bit more often. Let's just scoot over to the news desk because I have got some big news to share. I think we might even have a drum roll. Hey Supers, I'm delighted to announce that I'll be running an Act in the Workplace Train the Trainer course in April and May next year, over four sessions in partnership with Joe Oliver at Contextual Consulting. It's been a while in the planning, and you'll find the link to all the details in the show notes. Also, I'm planning a summer series of live podcast recordings, which is super exciting, and I'll be sharing more news shortly as it emerges. Thanks to everyone who listened, shared, and rated part one with Heather. Your support is what makes the People Soup community so special. So please do keep listening and sharing, and letting me know what you think too. It can get a bit lonely sometimes here in podcast land. So, for now, get a brew on and have a listen to part two of my chat with Heather McKee. Heather, I'd like to dive into your work even more than we have already and really start exploring healthy habits that stick. And at the end of the last episode, you said something that really attracted my attention about working with some carers in the NHS, building self-compassion. Wow. And... I am so on board with that. I think a lot of the work I do is allowing NHS professionals to to think about how they can look after themselves. Often their own self-care falls way down their mm. to-do list and they see it as a sort of secondary or thirdly priority. But tell us more about self-compassion for carers, please, if you would. Yeah, well... I, I think you've, you've, you know, you summarise it so perfectly there, Ross, as, as in, you know, they actually almost expend all their compassion treating others and then leave very little for themselves. And that makes, you know, people burn out quite easily. It, it, it can affect their health in, in all sorts of ways. And being a carer is hard enough as it is, but it's even harder if you're being hard on yourself about it. And, you know, we find that a lot in caring communities that people, you know, actually just don't spend that much time caring for themselves and actually feel quite guilty caring for themselves um, and yet find it so easy to care be compassionate and express care towards each other so uh, or to, towards others and so I suppose in in the talks that I'm doing with them it's, it's it's more about you know giving them space and permission I think permission is a very important word to care for themselves and to know what that looks like that it doesn't necessarily mean bubble baths and you know glasses of red wine and chocolate which is wonderful but it's also actually knowing about when they need to go into the bathroom and have a take a breath it's also about knowing when they need to go for a walk outside on their own just to clear their head it's about knowing when they need to step away when they realize that they've overstepped their own personal boundaries 
It's about knowing about how to speak to themselves in an encouraging way when they're finding that things are getting on top of themselves. It's about, ultimately, it's about exactly what I said. It's about giving them permission to care for themselves. And I think often I say, you know, we're all looking for permission. We're all waiting for someone just to say, it's okay, you can do this. And I, I always say, you know, I say, I'm giving it to you right now. Here you go. This is it. You've got permission to take care of yourselves. What are you going to do with that permission? And then we, we, we look to build some skills in order to engage with that. So we work on strengths-based stuff. So acknowledging their strengths, thinking about times where they've shown strength and, and leaning into those strengths and maybe picking a couple of character strengths that they wish to focus in on and hone in on because you know I suppose we're all too busy focused on what we do wrong rather than what we do right and and so training the brain to focus on what we do well and where our strengths are and I think there's something you you do so naturally Ross you know in the last episode you know you use the word tenacity and you use the word curiosity and, and you know you you mention those strengths and immediately it makes the person feel like yes I can do this like you know Ross thinks I'm a tenacious person and can we not just do that for ourselves? Can we can we tune into what our, our true strengths are? And that's certainly an exercise we do. Another one is thought reframing, which I think is something you probably do in your work as well, Ross, about what are those negative thought habits that come up time and time again? What's that negative conversation that we have with ourselves? And, and what's a more positive or more encouraging or more even true mm. statement that we could make or mantra we could have for when those thoughts come up? So thoughts might be, you know, Oh, cycling, for example. Oh, well, I, I haven't cycled again this week. I'm a failure or I'm only going to do three kilometers this time. I failed. Instead of saying, I'm returning from injury and I'm treating my body with care and kindness. So I'm going to pace myself because this is a lifelong habit that I want to engage with. And I don't want to come back too early and burn myself out. I'm going to take the time that I need to return to this. And it's the exact same behavior. It's not about pulling the wool over anyone's eyes or walking around with rose tinted glasses. It's about seeing the strength within you and withdrawing that strength and empowering yourself with that strength. Wow. I want to reflect on a couple of points there because the word permission is so super important. Mm. People are waiting for that permission. We often get that word used in feedback, particularly in healthcare settings. I feel like I have permission that it's okay to look after myself. And it resonates with work I've done with teachers as well. Teachers, again, who are so focused on learning and educating and supporting our young people that they can forget to look after themselves Mm. or think that that's a bit weak or you just need to crack on. And that's what leads to to burnout and and disconnection from what gives us meaning and motivation. Mm. And it's funny because... You know, we all think that we need that inner critic because that's what gets us to our goals. But Mm. ultimately, time and time again in studies, they've shown that people that have a more compassionate voice get to their goals faster and they they find the journey more enjoyable. And certainly when it comes to habits, they actually, the more compassionate you are, the more likely you are to exercise, the more likely you are to spend time on things like nutrition, the more likely you are to give yourself enough sleep each night the more likely you are to be able to set boundaries that actually allow you then to thrive when you're in these positions of caring or giving to other people because you've managed to kind of, I, I'm not sure if I love this phrase, but fill your cup first, you know, um, so that you're, you're feeling full and whole. So then you can, you're not living, giving what's left, you're giving what's, you know, best in a way because you've actually had that time to nourish yourself psychologically, emotionally, you know, mentally, socially, whatever way it, it needs to be. And actually... On that note, one little exercise um, that we do in the session, which I absolutely love, it's from a researcher called Dr. Kristen Neff, who you probably know well. She, you know, she's one of the kind of key people in self-compassion, and it's called the self-care check-in. And, and it's about you know thinking multiple times throughout the day, just for the peace supers that maybe haven't heard this exercise before. It's picking you know times throughout your day when you're struggling or you find yourself berating yourself or you feel like you're run a bit ragged, and just stopping for a second and asking yourself what can I do in this moment to nourish myself? And that doesn't necessarily mean go and eat food, but you might find that you, when you ask yourself that question, you realize you're hungry and you missed lunch or you know, you're really thirsty and you actually haven't had a glass of water yet or whatever it happens to be. But it could also mean, what do I need to do physically? So it might be that you need to go out for a walk and clear your head or you need to just even just release tension that you've been holding in your shoulders or your neck after a difficult phone call or 
it might be socially you might be actually feeling a little bit lonely you might find yourself on your phone trying to connect to people maybe you need to go and talk to someone or have a phone call or it might be you know that you need something like you need a good laugh you need to go find a youtube video that makes you laugh or it might be that you know you need to go and you know pet the cat or the dog or you know see a child and and just see that innocence but actually by training ourselves you know multiple times a day just to say just to stop for a second and ask ourselves what is it that I need in this moment to nourish myself can really help us tune in to actually our own self-awareness it can help us to understand what our true needs are and it also stops us kind of indulging in those behaviors that actually maybe short term seem quite pleasurable and rewarding but long term aren't actually that nourishing so you know maybe binging on you know streaming tv or alcohol or food or you know over consuming social media you know it, it's actually training that personal intuition and that connection with ourselves that we're ultimately learning to to love and nourish ourselves better yeah thank you for bringing up that exercise i absolutely love it and i'm a real admirer of christian neff's work mm. But that what can I do now to nourish? I think that's such a lovely pause in a day and such a compassionate act because perhaps we haven't shown up as the best version of ourselves. We've snapped at someone or we've realised it's got to the end of the day and we haven't been out on our bikes Mm. and we've fully intended to. What can I do to nourish myself with kindness? And it could be going to speak to a person that maybe we realise we haven't been our best selves with or it could be just going outside and taking a moment to breathe. Yeah and connect with nature, having a look at what's around you. Or it could be setting myself up for tomorrow to go out on my bike and identifying a time I'm going to do it and put it in my diary. Mm. So not being so hard on ourselves. And, and you're right, ACT has a similar approach, again, from cognitive behavioural therapy, but ACT is considered like a third wave. And ACT, they call it cognitive diffusion. So can I get a bit of space between myself and that unhelpful thought? Mm. That unhelpful thought may be like, oh, I haven't been out on my bike. That means I'm a failure and I'm never going to nail this. And it allows us to realise the humanity of having thoughts like mm. that. They're kind of normal. It normalises thoughts like yeah. that. It says, look, you're going to have these as a human being. And that's normal. And if you get a bit of space, there's various techniques, but if you get a bit of space between yourself and that thought, then you can see it for what it is. And maybe that space gives you a chance to think about how could I connect with what really matters to me in this next moment? Yeah. How could I reconnect to that? And it's one psychologist called Kelly Wilson, one of the founders of ACT, he called it like a lifetime of gentle returns to what matters. And I love that because it encapsulates compassion, it encapsulates that we're going to fail mm. and that we can get back on the horse yeah. or the bike. So, so yeah, it's, it's so lovely to hear I wonder, you know, when people hear us say that, it might strike fear into them in a way because they're like, what matters to me? I don't know what matters. Like, you know, and and, and suddenly that becomes a little bit of a a stress for Mm. them. I'm curious about how you approach that. Yeah, so maybe making it small and just experimenting a bit Mm. as well to think about, maybe I think about who matters to me. Yeah, lovely. But in terms of what matters, what it's like we were talking about earlier, what matters to me about getting out on my bike is seeing nature, mm. is feeling the, the weather on my face. There's something quite joyful about being on a bike for me, that, yeah. that human-powered locomotion <laughs> that is just like a kind of miracle. Yeah. I'm like, hey, I'm powering this yeah. contraption. And there's something quite joyful about that and... Kind of, you know, when you're going down a hill and you yeah. want to stick your legs out. And I just was going to let you in a little secret there because I was saying I pretty much every time I go down a hill on the bike, I always go, wee. <laughs> there we go. Kindred spirits. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's interesting, isn't it? Because like I think about this, like if I think about a specific example, you know, like typically you're at work and you're like right I'm feeling tired what can I do right now well I need to just caffeinate my way through this and push 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 whereas if you take that second like you say between stimulus and response and you say well actually what do I need right now maybe it's you haven't actually gotten up from your desk in the last two or three hours you know or if you're finding yourself going on BBC news and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling maybe it's that you need a break you know 
Um, mm. And the thing is, we get confused. We think, oh, well, I just need more caffeine rather than, well, actually, I haven't had enough sleep and I'm actually just tired or I need more sugar because, oh, well, actually, I just need that energy. But actually, are there other ways in which you can get that energy that feel more nourishing? And um, by stepping away and creating that gap between the thoughts, we can start to say, well, actually, no, another, my heart's already pounding. Another coffee's going to send me right over the edge. I'm going to feel so anxious. I'm going to be, you know, jittering around with my pen like I'm trying to like sing along to the Riverdance soundtrack or something crazy, you know. <laughs> and, and so actually, yeah, like creating that space there. It doesn't have to be, you know, a real profound, like, what's my purpose in life? And I need to align myself with that huge purpose. It can be as simple as, do you know what, having another coffee right now is going to be too much for me. It's going to send me over the edge. Well, it would be nice if I just stepped out on the balcony and just felt the fresh air on my face for a few minutes. No technology, nothing, and just took a break. And it, it's surprising how little people do that these days now. You know, we all, we're all kind of seduced by the cult of busyness and actually more like the keeping up with the Joneses cult of the busyness. You know, I'm more busy than you. Are you busy? Oh, I'm more busy than that. And I haven't taken a break mm. in X hours and, you know, whatever else. And that's something that I think is really important. And it's something that I always try and encourage with the companies I work with in terms of the culture as well. You know, when people say, oh, well, I've got this unhelpful behavior or I find I'm eating too much, drinking too much, not exercising enough, not sleeping well enough, not managing my stress. And I ask, well, what what do you do to manage your stress throughout the day? How do you take a break? What happens there? What are the behaviors that happen there? And often people, you know, can't tell me how they take a break. They say, oh, well, I might go on my phone or I might, you know, I think especially actually given that the world has, has become much more, you know, virtual, a lot of people, you know, won't talk to someone on their break necessarily or, you know, like we would go for lunch with a colleague maybe in the past. That that stuff has kind of gone out the window and it's almost retraining people again to think about, well, what do I need in this moment to nourish me? What are the activities that nourish me? Because when you ask people often, they don't know what those are. And I think that's a, an interesting process to start to establish a toolkit of, of behaviours and, and little breaks you can have throughout the day that really do leave you feeling refreshed and nourished super interesting to hear you because we we are so aligned because i think if i'm feeling a bit despondent my go-to thing if i'm feeling tired or frustrated in my working day i might go oh i'm gonna have a biscuit yeah i'm gonna have a bag of crisps or something yeah and that might satisfy me in that short-term moment that instant where i grab a hobnob Mm. but then great choice that's not who i want to be in the long term yeah You know what I mean? The longer term, we don't often think about the longer term consequences Mm. of just keeping going or having another coffee. And the cues as well, if you think about the repetition, like each time you eat the hobnob, when you're tired, next time you're tired, you think, oh, what did I do the last time? Oh, I ate a hobnob. That's what made me feel better. That's what made me feel rewarded in this. You know, if we look at the the kind of habit loop, which is cue or trigger behavior reward, we think our brain starts to create a neurological feedback loop around that and says, okay, Mm. Ross, you're tired. Okay, let's have a biscuit because that's what we did the last time and that'll feel good. And then the more you repeat that in the same given context or circumstance, the more likely that is to become habitual, both in thought and in action to the point where you find yourself in the kitchen with the hobnobs without even having to think about it. Yeah, and you don't even remember whether you've had a hobnob. No. So then you go and have another one. Yeah. Other biscuits are available. Yeah. (laughs) It was interesting because in one of our studies we found there was two types a day. Because I was fascinated by this. Like, when do people give in to temptations and why? And one of the things we found was that around 3.30, 4 o'clock and around 8.30 in the evening were the times that people most gave in to temptations. And, you know, people thought that temptation was just an isolated incident, kind of a one-time only thing. But actually, most people had this pattern of behavior within their temptation incidences. And at three or four, it was generally because they needed a break in the day. And so I called it, I renamed it the biscuit slump because, you know, it's when we kind of needed or maybe we could call it the hobnob slump. You know, when we felt like we just needed that extra little bit of energy and, you know, that was the only way we thought we could have a break. And in the evening, it was things like alcohol, temptations and, and other things. But it's quite a curious exercise and I think it's something that you know the pea supers can do themselves as well if they wanted to you know over the next week track when you're most tempted and why because that will give you an insight into actually how to unravel those unhelpful habits because if you're finding at a certain time of day you're always kind of craving a biscuit yes it might be habitual because you've done it so often but 
what's driving that? Is it, you know, that you need that energy boost at that time of day? Maybe because you haven't eaten enough lunch. Is it that you need a break at that time of day? So you're looking for stress relief or you're just looking to get out of the room that you're in or you're looking to do something else. You know, you can start to experiment with that. And I always say, you know, if you think about habits on a loop, you've got your cue or trigger, you've got your behavior, your reward. Every habit, every behavior, if it's helpful, it's unhelpful, or if you want to call them good or bad habits, they all are in response to a particular reward. So if we can understand more about what that reward is, then we can look at what are other ways that I could serve this reward at this time. So for example, typical example would be, you know, drinking to socialize. And it's like, well, people actually, you know, they might not even like the drinking part or when the drinking kind of spirals, it actually is just that they're wanting to be around their colleagues. They're wanting to have a chat. They're wanting to have a debrief. They're wanting to unwind. Is there another way? Is something we experimented with one of the companies I used to work with pre-COVID. Thursday, they had a massive drinking culture and they wanted to kind of cut down on it. And on a Thursday, they'd always go for pints. And, you know, people were saying like, it's great catching up with the team, but they're finding Friday, it's affecting productivity. You know, people are kind of rolling into the weekend or whatever, not feeling so great. And so we looked at, well, what are they looking for in that habit? Like, what are they looking for in those behaviours? What are they searching for in the alcohol? And it was connection with their colleagues. And so we experimented with a few different things. And the thing that they found actually that stuck for them was they started going rock climbing on a Thursday all together. And they found that they got the same feelings of bonding with their colleagues, but they got this kind of endorphin release as well and this stress relief and everything. And, and actually the positive challenge of trying a new activity and, and, and supporting each other to try that new activity. And it was quite interesting because the cue was the same, the same time of day on a Thursday, the behavior was getting together as a group of colleagues and the reward was still a social reward, but it was just a different type of habit. It wasn't the drinking. It became the rock climbing for them. Gosh, what a fabulous example. I absolutely love that because it's it's kind of like manifesting your curiosity and what I see in the way you, you talk and the way you're making this accessible for people is your your curiosity, your playfulness, and you're encouraging people to experiment. Because as you've said earlier, we're not experts in being those other people. So we can't say this is what you need to do. Uh -uh. We can give you the skills that you can help and try in your own context to see what works and what doesn't. And adopting that stance of being curious and kind with yourself is at the heart of all of that. It's like I often say to people that the skills I'm looking to cultivate and support people in developing were never taught at school. No were never taught as a, to me as a young adult. And for me, I think the workplace is an arena where we can go in and have an audience that hopefully will be curious and interested and there'll be a thirst for this because people might just be stuck or fed up or thinking they can never change. Mm. What motivates you to get out of bed in the morning and go and spring up and work with <laughs> organisations and, and do those scary things like keynotes? I think I focus on what it gives me back. I, I really do practice what I preach in terms of everything as well as failing. <laughs> you know, I think about those conversations I have with people at the end. I, I, but I, I like to caveat that by saying every time before I do a keynote, probably the 20 minutes before it, I'm like, why do I do this to myself? <laughs> why have I done this to myself again? This is terrifying. What if I forget because I tend to go on tangents as you've probably seen what if I forget what I'm talking about and can't bring it back to the point or you know what if I, my mouth goes dry and sticks to the top of my, my lipstick together or some sort of thing that's never happened before but for some reason will happen just in that session at the right moment but then when I get up there I, I actually think keynote speaking is one of the most mindful activities you could possibly do in the world because you cannot listen to your brain. You can't listen to thoughts because you're talking all of the time. And so you need to be with the audience. You need to be looking at things. You need to be seeing how people receive you as well as trying to you know, convey that message in a way that's going to be accessible for them and react to the energy and, and understand more. And so it's an incredibly mindful activity because you should be so in that moment. You cannot be anywhere else but in the room with people. And, and in that way, I find it quite an emotional thing to do as well. And, and so at the end, I always find it quite interesting because people have seen you speak for an hour, but you haven't actually met those people individually face to face, but they all come up to you afterwards like you're an old friend and say, oh, Heather, you talked about this. Or I often find I'll be in the toilet and someone will be kind of 
you know, coming up to me in the toilet and being like, oh, do you know what? You said this thing or whatever. And, and I, I just love those conversations. And I think that's really, I know this sounds a bit silly, but it's those penny drop moments for people when they're like, it's all so simple. And I, and they don't mean that to be offensive to my keynotes. You know, it's all so simple. But um, they're like, it's just so simple. I have been complicating this for myself for so long. And actually, you know, I feel like, you know, like the Wizard of Oz story, you know, I kind of feel like my philosophy is similar in that way. Like we all have to go on a bit of a journey and meet various different friends and learn different skills along the way and fight different battles and journeys and, you know, inner demons and outer demons and all of that. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we learn that we have those skills inside of us all along. And it's just about actually discovering those skills and unraveling all the layers that block those skills. And then, all, and that's kind of my aim to help people find that, you know, those ruby slippers within or that sense of that ability to go home and um, that they've always had, but never really realized. And I think it's ultimately a coming home to themselves. And that's something I think about a lot before I, I do a talk. Maybe there won't be, you know, maybe it won't be the 300 people in the room that will feel that way, but maybe there'll be three and, and that's enough for me. And um, I, I focus in on honing on those three people. Wow, I love what you're saying about... Thank you, first of all, for being such a role model for us because saying you're nervous before a keynote might surprise some people Yeah. because you, you love doing it and you get energy from it. But I absolutely get that. It's like when I'm facilitating a, a training yeah. or, or, or doing a, a talk or a lecture, perhaps, there is that nervousness, but there's a, also a mission we're on. Yeah. And I love the way you describe it as a really mindful activity. Mm. Because if we're not out there looking at the people, looking at the energy in the room, maybe responding to questions, maybe switching up our tone or just being our human selves, mm. and we're not aware of what's going on in the room, then it's not going to land. No. Which is why you're successful at what you do. And you have a great presence and energy and a great voice for a podcast, by the way. Oh. <laughs> do you know, it's so funny. Someone just wrote on my feedback from a talk I did last week that I have a late night DJ voice so it's very easeful <laughs> it just made me like a giggle a late I think you've peaked yeah I think that's it, it. That's a late it. night DJ voice yeah I know it's like maybe I'll read your bedtime stories that'll be maybe that'll be my new career I'll, I'll branch into that's, bedtime stories for people relaxing tone that's brilliant <laughs> people sometimes say to me um oh you could get voiceover work yeah I'm like well I think it's already a very crowded marketplace, yeah. but, um, but who knows? Maybe we should explore that together. Yeah, I was actually, I did an interview at um, the BBC a while ago and the guy on it, the producer was like, oh, you'd be great in audiobooks. <laughs> and I was like, there you go, squiggly career, we'll jump around. <laughs> yeah. Oh God, that would be fun. Yeah. Maybe it'll be an audio book of your own book. Yeah, maybe. What plans are there for Heather in the future? Anything that you can reveal to us yet? Yeah, great question. I think I, I would like to write a book. I, I think there's a lot of, you know, habit stuff out there. It's, it's quite, the market's quite male dominated at the moment in terms of habit change as well. So I think a female voice would be quite nice um, in amongst that. But I think there's still, there's still a little bit of way for me to go before that maybe. And I, I'm not trying to be a perfectionist about it, but I don't know, I think doing the keynotes and bringing all the stuff together for the talks actually makes you realize you know how then you could apply that to a book and it's really helpful to have that structure and framework around it so it's certainly something that I'd love to do in the future I think for now I think traveling with work and and, and speaking and meeting people I, I really I found it quite hard in COVID that I, I loved meeting people virtually online and I, I found that really just so needed and now I just get so excited to see people in face to face in, in different countries with different cultures and different habit struggles and I think certainly would love to the opportunity to travel a bit more now at work that the the world is is, is opened up a little bit I think that would be something that would really excite me ask me on any other day I'll probably give you a different answer every day it depends if I've just mm -hmm. come back from somewhere <laughs> you know I've got I haven't got that wanderlust but um I used to do a bit of speaking before COVID, you know, in, in different countries and, and stuff. And then a lot of it went webinar, which I love and it, it's wonderful. But there's nothing that beats that feeling of looking someone in the eye and, and being able to really see, you know, how they absorb something and having that face-to-face -face chat afterwards. It's just so magic. 
Now, Heather, you've already been super generous with some exercises for us P-supers, but is there any other takeaway you'd offer us to go away and reflect on or practice? Yeah, I think less than a practice. Or I suppose, what did I talk about? I talk about finding your why and, and asking yourself, why is this important to me? And, you know, we often talk about in psychology, you need to ask yourself five whys till you get to a true why or be just annoying toddler and keep saying, but why, but why, but why? And that'll help you uncover that intrinsic motivation. We talked about the importance of finding joy and tuning into those specific things to like help, you know, create that craving like Ross, you know, before you go for your cycle, listening to the birds, feeling the wind in your face, all of those wonderful, you know, going down the hill going, wee, all of those things that bring you joy and how that makes the rest easy. And uh, another thing... I think that is quite important for people to remember is, you know, we're so often looking for that secret sauce, you know, and we're always looking for that secret when it comes to, you know, long term change. And I always say, you know, it's time to realize that there is no secret. Like, you know, if you keep telling yourself, you know, the reason that you haven't achieved your life goals or your health goals yet is because you haven't found that secret sauce yet it's time to realize that you are the secret sauce and you know the only equipment the only ingredient the only superfood you need is you and ultimately you know you can change your habits and as your life if you've got the right framework for change but I, I think that's what's what behavioral science gives it gives that method in the recipe for health like we talked about at the very start how to take all of these ingredients like what to eat or you know sleep habits or managing your stress better and put them into the context of your life so it's most relevant for you and I think that's really really important you know to know that you are the secret sauce and the solution doesn't come outside of you it actually comes from within you that that's really super useful and powerful and I also see a merchandising opportunity there (laughs) Heather frankly I'll be disappointed if later this year I don't see on your websites t-shirts that say you are your own secret secret sauce sauce. yeah you were the I love that (laughs) (laughs) Maybe I'll get a sponsorship of Heinz or someone like, you know, yeah. have a secret recipe. Only ingredient is you. <laughs> nice. Oh, my gosh. Look, we're getting so many potential um, endorsements yeah. here. We didn't mention my tea was Yorkshire tea, by the way. Yeah. That's Yorkshire tea. <laughs> but Heather prefers a whole variety of tea, yeah. but including the Irish one that's called... Berries. <laughs> Berries, Yay. which I have sampled recently on my on my trips to Dublin. Yay. Now, Heather, I've got a new question for guests, yeah. and it's, do you have a favourite episode of People Soup? Yes, I do. And it might be salience bias because I've listened to it twice, but it's your episode with Lou, your old friend. And I, I think oh, there's just so many moments in it where I felt my heart just warm. I think, you know, she just sounded like the most wonderful person. And I think when she talked about love being her value, that just kind of broke my heart into pieces. And I thought she was such a beautiful compassionate person and like you know the importance of creating she talked about the importance of creating a toolkit for anxiety and she talked about the importance of finding pleasure and joy and I don't know it just really resonated with me in in so many ways so I really I really enjoyed that one I also enjoyed your singing of Katy Perry roar on that one (laughs) oh gosh another one where I sang and I'm absolutely delighted beyond words you've chosen that episode it's it's just touched me. It's a very special episode with a very special person yeah. who's no longer with us. Yeah. So so thank you. Thank you for that. And you could really tell, you know, you had such a, a wonderful connection with each other as well, which I just thought was quite special. Oh, thank you. And Heather, thank you so much for coming on the show. I suspect we could both keep chatting yeah. to each other for hours. It's been such a joy to have you on the show and hear more about your work and your approach and how you, you really live it. You said earlier that you want to really live your approach and hell you certainly do so thank you for being such a role model for us all and thank you for the work you do hats off to you thank you thank you Ross really appreciate that that's it part two in the bag thanks so much to Heather for being so open and generous in all that she shared Don't forget to get yourself over to Heather's webpage and sign up for her free bite-sized habits course. We'd love to get your reviews, so please let us know what you think on the socials or drop me an email or a voice note on WhatsApp. If you like this episode of the podcast, please could you do three things. Number one, share it with one other person. Number two, subscribe to the podcast and give us a five-star review, whatever platform you're on, and particularly if you're on Apple Podcasts. 
the Apple charts are really important in the podcast industry. And number three, share the heck out of it on the socials. This will all help us reach more people with stuff that could be useful. I love to hear from you and you can get in touch at peoplesoup.pod at gmail.com. On Twitter, we are at peoplesouppod. On Instagram, at people.soup. And on Facebook, we are at peoplesouppod. Thanks to Andy Glenn for his spoon magic and Alex Engelberg for his vocals. Most of all, dear listener, thanks to you. Look after yourselves, peace supers, and bye for now. Ross, I must say, my face is hurting because I'm smiling so much. Oh. <laughs> this is just so fun. I'm just like, my, I feel like my cheeks are sore. <laughs>